אני רוצה להזמין את דוקטור אבנר ברנע, הוא יושב ראש פימת וחבר ועדת ההיגוי של הכנס שלנו. אבנר מארגן ימי עיון בנושא מודיעין עסקי תחרותי כל שנה במסגרת הכנס. את ההרצאה בנושא איך מתבצע מודיעין תחרותי בחברת ענק דל יעביר ג'יי נקגאווה והוא יציג אותו עכשיו. אבנר ברנע בבקשה. שלום לכולם. ג'יי כבר על הקו? כן, ראינו אותו. ראיתם אותו? כן. אוקיי. So I'm, I'm going to speak in, in English. Jay, how, I, I hope you hear me. Jay? I can hear you just fine. Oh, great, great. Good morning. It's early morning in Denver. It is. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm... Good morning in Denver? Yeah. Okay, good morning. <laughs> and, and I'm really, you know, I appreciate it so much that you woke up so early in order to, to meet our Israeli audience. We appreciate it so much. Um, so I would just say a few words about, uh, about Jay, and uh, then the flow will be his. So Jay, is the, uh, is, is the, his title is Director of Competitive Intelligence at Dell Technologies. Under him, there are 18 experts in um, all aspects of technologies and uh, solutions. And it's very important to, to uh, emphasize that in Dell, competitive intelligence it's, is really a cornerstone in its activities in order to uh, maintain its um, competitive advantage. And not, you know, it's, uh, Dell is a huge corporation. It's so encouraging to know that they give priority competitive intelligence to competitive intelligence. And we'll hear in a minute from Jay how actually they are doing it. Jay has, um, holds an MBA from Regis University. He's also a member of, of the board of directors of, of SCIP, um, Strategic and Competitive Intelligent Professionals Association, and I'm, I'm so uh, glad to share the uh, board with Jay and some other good friend of us. And the title of his talk today will be How Competitive Intelligence is Performed at Dell. And I have to say to our audience that this is a very unique a opportunity for us to hear um, a presentation by, uh, by somebody who is uh, working in such a, a leading corporation in the US. We don't have, we're not too often, we have an opportunity to hear uh, um, about CI in huge corporations in, in the world, not just United States. So, Jay, the floor is yours, and I'm really anxious to, to, to listen and to learn from you, please. Okay, thank you, Abner. It's good to see you, my friend. It, it is early, but uh, I don't mind being here for you. So thank you. Thank, thank you for you the, so much. To the audience for, uh, for attending and staying so late in your day. I'm, I'm sure you've had a full day, so I'll try and make this concise. I apologize that this is in English only, but you probably wouldn't want to hear it in Japanese. So with that said, I'll start the presentation. And let me know when you can see the screen. Yes, we see. It's good. Okay, good. Hopefully I'll have good bandwidth. I, little, I live a little bit remote. I live in Denver, Colorado. I live a little bit on the remote side of the uh, city. So bandwidth is always a little bit of a, a variable issue out here. And we'll see how we do today. Uh, as Avner said, I'm Jay Nakagawa. Um, I'm the director of competitive intelligence. And yes, I do have a 18 member team within the competitive intelligence organization at large. Uh, we support all of uh, Dell technologies, both what we called ISG and CSG. CSG being the client piece, which is your desktop, laptops, notebook, uh, monitors, printers, all stuff that you normally get as a home consumer. And then we also support ISG, which is all the infrastructure part of the business, which is uh, servers, networking, storage, cloud, um, 
data protection, uh, Apex, our new as a service offering. So we cover a, a wide variety of what uh, we have within Dell Technologies. Uh, from a headcount standpoint, it's roughly, it's uh, basically 40 people in total. Uh, I, I manage about half of that. And from a revenue standpoint, that's about $2 billion per headcount from our team. So as you can imagine, we get hit with a lot of different things. And over time, we've had to try and figure out how we can best leverage the team, our resources, and deliver things that everybody wants because we have everybody from our sales organization. And as you'll see, we are very focused on sales enablement. That's really the core part of our mission. However, we do get uh, inquiries from people like Michael Dell. As a matter of fact, just this past week, uh, Michael asked us to do some research on a new competitive offering. And it, the, the company really isn't the competitor to more of the co-opetition where to both the partner as well as a potential uh, competitor. But he said, what do we know about this? And I need an answer today. So we were able to shift resources, jump into action, but though, you know, we serve both masters there. So what I'm going to go through today is, you know, what is competitive intelligence? And that's, you know, it's not really the industry uh, definition. It's more of our perspective from Dell Technologies. And by the way, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is not necessarily what you would use, but I wanted to give you some perspective on how we evolved from a competitive intelligence function over time. Uh, when I first took over the group, and uh, it was either 2013 or 2014, uh, we were very rudimentary. Uh, we had a total of uh, four people in the organization, including myself. So we were very small at that point in time. And I'll explain some of the things that we had to do to overcome the challenges. Um, where CI lives does make a difference. And I think you all know that, but I'll give you an example. We'll talk about some of the tools that we use because uh, I, I, I tend to think of us as what you call the dumb dog meaning that there's the old fable about a dog that climbs a tree and another dog is sitting at the base of the tree and as the dog is climbing up, the, the dog at the bottom goes, hey you, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm climbing the tree. He goes, dogs can't climb trees. He goes, well, nobody told me that. And we're kind of that way within our group. We do things sometimes and we stumble upon solutions because we don't know any better. And we're very fortunate to be within the infrastructure of Dell where we can try different things. And hopefully some of the things I could pass on to you today will help you uh, either decide to take a very uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, attempt at things, or you'll learn some things from trials and errors that we've made. Uh, we'll, we'll finish up with uh, some of the stakeholder stuff and then a summary. So a little bit about me, and I'm only gonna take a, couple, uh, a minute here to go through. Um, I started my career back in 1983, so I've been around for a while. Uh, started off in mainframes with IBM, and uh, over the course of time, I think I've worked for, uh, I figured it out, 22 different companies over the course of my career. And all that really means, and I was changing jobs every two years, so what that really means is I was a millennial before it became fashionable to become a millennial. Uh, currently with Dell Technologies, a variety of different companies over my career. Some are mainframes, some are software, some are storage. Um, JCIT was uh, supply chain management or just-in-time manufacturing software. Uh, McData's on there twice, not because I made a mistake, but because I actually did two tours of duty with them. Uh, the first time in sales internationally and the second time as a uh, product manager. Uh, some of the other companies like BEC Systems, we did a uh, Teradata uh, performance management. So very uh, eclectic uh, career path for me. And, you know, I, I think at times it works out very, very well because I have a lot of contacts throughout the industry. Uh, as Avner mentioned, I'm also a member of SKIP, both as a board member as well as a frequent presenter. Uh, I've also presented in uh, China several times with our sister organization called CC, which is the uh, China Institute of Competitive Intelligence. Uh, frequently speak at Frost and Sullivan conferences, as well as participate in the Council of Competitive Intelligence Fellows. So that's a little bit about me from a professional standpoint. From a personal standpoint, um, I raised five beautiful kids. I've raised them all since they were very young, so they all call me dad. Um, and, and it's quite gratifying because now they have kids, some of them have kids of their own. 
Uh, my wife and I, Veronica, she lives, we live in Colorado, so we do a lot of act, outdoor activities. This happened to be one of our ATV trips, which we enjoy quite a bit. We haven't been able to get up in the last couple of years just because of uh, work and obviously the pandemic, but uh, hopefully that's a uh, activity we can resume here shortly. I am also a musician. Well, that's a, uh, this is a small sample of uh, my band and the pictures from when we played at the uh, Los Angeles Jazz Festival, well attended, and I got a chance to play with my, the band of my childhood um, admiration, which is a band called Chase, for those of you who may have an interest. Obviously, music, music is a big part of my life. Uh, this was back in college. I'm in the far right back uh, corner. Uh, some people actually wonder if I had hair, and I did at one point in time. I also led my own 17-piece jazz band in the, uh, the mid-2000s uh, in Denver. Uh, being in Colorado, we do a lot of camping. We love, enjoy outdoor activities. I'm also a competitive uh, food, food competition. I like doing barbecue, and so we have these food competitions and I participate in those. Uh, that is my former smoker. I just bought a new one. No, it's not bigger. It's actually a little bit smaller. Uh, we were involved in scouting. We started our local scout unit back in 1999 and a couple of uh, Eagle Scouts from our, our organization. And a lot of time is spent now with my grandkids. So uh, just to give you some idea of what I'm about as a person. From a standpoint of Dell Technologies, this is one of the questions I ask uh, right off the bat, because when I ask people, when you think about De Te Dell Technologies, how big do you think we are? And I get answers all over the place from uh, 20 billion to 40 billion. Uh, we're actually a large company at 94.2 billion. We actually grew yes last year in the uh, midst of the pandemic. Uh, we do have about 150,000 team members doing work from home. We were uh, very fortunate in that we've been working on migrating to a home workplace over the last few years. Consequently, it was just a matter of turning on our remote working and we had about 150 uh, team members working from home uh, basically one weekend. From a competitive intelligence standpoint, you know, it's really about gathering information, analyzing the information and trying to make some sense of or get some actionable items out of that. Uh, so it's very, you know, it's kind of based upon three pillar. We happen to agree with this. This is basically how we do it. More, more specifically, our mission here is we uh, are a world-class competitive intelligence organization, and we are focused on sales, pre-sales, and partners. So our job is to go out there and do research that enables our partners and our direct uh, salespeople to compete effectively in the marketplace. Now, for any one particular area, let's take it as uh, storage as an example. Uh, that part of the organization came from the legacy uh, EMC organization. And as you can imagine with storage, we've got hundreds of competitors, literally. Everything from data protection, uh, primary storage, mid-range mid storage, entry storage, uh, what, what they call object storage today, which is long-term, uh, use a lot for long-term storage. We have hundreds of competitors. Obviously, even with a team of 18 people in my group, we can't cover it all. But what we try and focus on are the main competitors that we run into. Uh, we use Salesforce we, so we know how that changes over time and which competitors that we're running into. So we're very good about keeping track of the competitors, keeping track of those trends, and adjusting our coverage model to, to handle that appropriately. Um, a lot of the times we'll get inquiries from the field about what we call ankle biters or startups. A lot of them, uh, interestingly enough, comes from uh, Israel. And they're all very, uh, very well thought out products. So those tend to give us a little bit more of a uh, time to do analysis, but we cover the biggest ones that we can first. And as these, as we call ankle biters come up into play, we do analysis, we try and figure out, you know, just as a hint for those of you who might be uh, some of our competitors, we check sources like Crunchbase. We try and find out about the, comp the company, who's funding it, who are the primary um, principals in the company, where did they come from? So we try and do a very thorough job to understand the competition before rendering some type of 
uh, positioning against the competition. And by the way, we are very um, ana analytically and metric focused. Uh, Michael Dell is a fanatic about having statistics because he goes, if you can't measure it, how do you know if you're being successful, which is absolutely true. So as you'll see when we go through the presentation here in a few more slides, we are pretty fanatical about keeping track of what's going on and measuring that every month and every quarter. So coming back to this slide, which we just saw a moment ago, by the way, let me just make sure I'm keeping track of my time. Okay, we're good. When I look at this chart, the question would be here, um, how can you identify where a company is going? And you might be thinking of different ways that you're keeping track. Let me give you an example that doesn't cost a lot of money, does cost a lot of time. It does cost a little bit of uh, effort to keep track of what's going on. So we had a, a competitor back, oh, I guess it must have been 10 years ago. And we knew that they were going to have to change their platform. It was older technology, it was software related. And so we knew they were going to have to change your technology. So the uh, question that came to us out of engineering at the time is, where's this competitor going? Well, there are some ways you can do that, but we decided to try something real easy and it worked out. We actually started monitoring this competitor's hiring board. So they were advertising on who they're hiring, what type of skill set they're looking for, what uh, geographical areas they're looking for talent. And as a result, we were able to determine that they were going to be shifting from their current technology and platform to some newer software technology. Uh, we did some investigation on what we thought was going to be their direction. We provided that back to engineering with, here's how many people they're hiring, here's the technology they're going to, because we knew about their business and what, what they're focusing on. As a result, uh, we were able to head off their engineering effort by about two years by beating them to the punch. So. Those are very easy way. That's an example of a very easy way to keep track of a competitor, where they're going, the technology that they're using, without having to go invest in a lot of uh, you know tools out there. I'm a big fan of this guy right here. His name is his name is Simon Sinek, and Simon is on the uh, TED Talks uh, circuit quite frequently. And Ted had a uh, talk which he, in which he explained that you have to understand why a competitor is doing something. So if you think back to our uh, mission of, and take it into context, why, what, and how, or, or what, well, what, how, and why, I'll go back here. You can see uh, what we are. We are a world-class CI organization. So that's the what. Uh, the how is uh, we create compelling and, and effective competitive messaging, training content, et cetera. The why is we want to enable sales to win more. So we fit that model and that wasn't intentional. That was, you know, kind of an afterthought. But Simon says, if you can get to the why a company is behaving in a certain manner, it can give you a lot of information. I apologize for the glare. It is 6.30, 6.20 in the morning and the sun is coming up in my office. So uh, for those of you who are getting the shine off my head, I apologize for that. But if you understand why a company is doing something, it helps to, uh, you know, you can sit there and say, okay, I can see what they're doing. I can see how they're doing it, but why are they doing it? Let me give you an example. Uh, back in 2016, 2017, we were monitoring uh, HP Enterprise. And we could see that they were selling off a bunch of their software, a bunch of products. Uh, some of them went to a company called Microfocus. Other ones got divested to other companies. And we sat here and said, okay, we can see what they're doing. They're divesting. We can see how they're doing it. They're taking a lot of their legacy software, breaking that off, selling it to Microfocus out of the UK. But the question was, why are they doing this? The conclusion we, re we reached was that they were doing what we call window dressing, that they were getting rid of products that would not make them attractive in a uh, acquisition or merger scenario. Turns out that our supposition was right. Um, State that they were doing. So then became a, a matter of who are they really trying to sell to? We narrowed it down to either Oracle or Microsoft. And as it turns out to be, it was Microsoft. Uh, Meg Whitman had a huge bonus uh, payout based on her, her getting a Microsoft to acquire HPE for the Azure cloud. As it turned out, that didn't happen. And that's partly why my, Meg left at that time. But if you can understand and ask further why is a company doing something? It'll give you some great insights 
And again, it doesn't take tools to do that. Tools can help in aggregating information about the company, but uh, at that time we didn't have a lot of tools. So we were doing a lot of uh, Google and, and, and uh, DuckDuckGo, which is another uh, search engine that we particularly are found, found, fond of. Um, so those are some of the things that we were doing to try and figure out what the competition was doing. Simon also has a great book called Start With Why. I think it's been translated into a lot of the languages at this point, but it's a, it's a good read. One of the questions I often get asked because I hire a lot of uh, great talented people over time. The most common question, believe it or not, that I get asked is, what does it take to excel in competitive intelligence? And what the real question is that I'm being asked by uh, companies is, what does it take to hire the best people? What attributes are you looking for when you're hiring people in the industry? And for me, it really comes down to a matter of what I call what's called gestalt, which is a uh, test to test really. From my standpoint, I think of it as uh, how, how do you deal with ambiguity? And by the way, Abner, I'll make these slides available to you so you can distribute it to the uh, attendees. So a great example of gestalt is really one where your mind will actually fill in the blanks. And so I haven't, you know, and the thing about gestalt that's interesting to me personally is that it follows a normal distribution curve. So it follows a bell-shaped curve. You have um, individuals who are really good at gestalt and some are really outstanding. And the other ones are below the curve. That doesn't mean, that's not a measure of intelligence by any means. It's a measure of, can I take a very ambiguous situation or nebulous situation and turn it into something that's meaningful or actionable? The good thing about Gestalt is that it can be learned. So it's, some people have it in an innate version. It's built in, they understand it. I happen to have a pretty good one. Um, I know people who are much better than I am, but you know that's always a good thing. So here's an example. I apologize, it's for an English speaking audience. But basically, what this is an example is, if you can read this, it shows that you're, you have a pretty good uh, level of gestalt. So basically, just looking at the first part of it, it says, if you can read this, you have a strange mind too. Can you read this? Only 55, so that fits the, the bell curve there. Only five people out of 100 can. I couldn't believe that. I could actually uh, understand what I was reading. So essentially, your mind is able to take this because it's looking for the first and last letter in a word. And so we don't actually read the letters, we actually look for, for uh, patterns and piece it together there. Here's another example. And again, it's an English uh, language example, so I apologize for that. But for English uh, native language, this is something that uh, everybody understands and has known since they were probably two. Um, like my grandson, he, he already can say this. And it's a pattern. And so the test here is, if you look at these letters, can you make sense of what the pattern is? And if you can, it may, you know, shows a, a certain level of gestalt. And this is really a sequence. And in this case here, and I'll move back a little bit out of the light, maybe that'll help. So I'm not overexposed on the camera. And it's basically a uh, pattern uh, counting from one to 10. And of course you could do that in any language. Uh, but basically it will test that. The reason Gestalt is important is because like the fabled blind man and the elephant, if you're so focused on a particular single element, you're only gonna see that part of it and you're gonna miss the rest of the big picture. So it's really about, from a Gestalt standpoint, it's about understanding the big picture, what does it mean and what does it mean from a competitive standpoint in our particular case? Because you wanna, you may focus on, you know, on a particular aspect, which might be a product, but if you're only looking at the product, you're going to miss the rest of everything, such as company, the company's finances, who's backing it, uh, is it being backed by, by folks that are reputable. Um, Dell Technologies has an investment arm, and we've got actually a very good track record. Um, I won't tell you the details behind it, but I know factually we have a great track record on the return on investment of companies that we invest in. So uh, Dell Technologies or Dell Ventures comes to us, he asks for input. Where's the market going? What is about this? Uh, you know, it's not a competitor at that point. What do you think about the technology? Where's, where can you project it going? So it's really looking at that big picture. And for me, that's a, a huge important part of hiring great CI people. 
moving on, let's take a look at organizational efficiency. That's easy for me to say at 6.30 in the morning. Um, and does it matter? And the answer is yes, because organizations and the structure behind it will determine things as, such as funding, how much funding can you have? Uh, we're, we're a large organization, but we are, you know, within a CR organization, uh, I can tell you that many of our competitors within the industry don't have organizations as big. But fortunately, and as I mentioned before, we have visibility, visibility all the way up to Michael Dell, his executive leadership team, um, our organization's executive staff. And so they're able to see, and we provide statistics. And that's why I said we're very fanatical about that because Michael could see what his return on investment is uh, by month, by quarter, by year. And as he sees the, the uh, revenue grow and the expenses being uh, maintained, he could see that we're doing our job on, on the analyzing competition, pricing, margin analysis based on what we're able to ascertain. And these are all done through ethical manners. So it's all public information. Um, we do talk with analysts. Uh, of course, the analysts are not uh, able to talk about proprietary things of the competition, but we, you know, we have a variety of different sources we go to and we triangulate all this different information to get uh, to make a decision or get a particular finding on a, on a competitor. Um, the key thing is here, who are the real stakeholders versus the noisiest ones? So as you probably know out there, your noisiest stakeholders may not be the real key stakeholders who uh, have the purse strings. Sometimes they are, sometimes they are not. So from an organizational standpoint, who are the key stakeholders? Well, it could be those pesky salespeople, you know, those people bring in revenue, but they're always asking for more and more and more. I need this, I need that. They're never satisfied. But in our case, uh, we have a great relationship with them and we could tell right away if something is going uh, not well because they're, they're pretty vocal about it. So the, in, the, in the case here, uh, having a noisy stakeholder can be a good thing. It might be the executives. And in our case, like I said, Michael and his executive leadership team often come to us and say, what do you think about this? Um, to give you an example, last fall, uh, Michael came and said, where's quantum computing today and where's it going? So we did some quick analysis and we said, it's still a little bit of a nascent uh, industry as a revenue generation standpoint, but there are certain some things certainly growing in interest. Uh, here are the areas that's missing things like with uh, software tools. Uh, but if you want to get some thought leadership, here's some ideas. And he opted to say, okay, and one of those options was do, not, do nothing for now. And that seemed to be uh, the one that had mo the most attraction to him, but it's still something he comes to us every few months to say, has that industry moved very much? Might be those uh, engineers, you know, those folks always want to know, what is the competition doing? Where's the market going? Is this something that uh, we can make a lot of money on or we can get started and be acquired because that's certainly a viable alternative? Is it those marketing folks wanting to know about the competition and messaging and positioning? Uh, but what about product management? How is the competition doing? What about this particular feature? And it always fascinates me with product managers who want to know about a particular feature. When most of the time, a single feature is not what's, what's going to sell a product. Um, I spent most of my career in product management, so um, I, I, uh, I tend to look at the whole product versus a particular feature, although I will take that into account. Uh, the scientists are another one, and also legal. Well, legal is a growing area for competitive intelligence along the uh, lines of patent analysis, a portfolio analysis. So there are various stakeholders, and so your stakeholders, like ours, may be one or many of these each with different degrees of importance. And as I said, remember, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. And those are the ones who hold the, uh, the cash and purse strings. This is something that was uh, done from a, from a, uh, from a guy named uh, Jerry Miller. Uh, it's an older book, it's a little bit dated, but still valid. And so you need to look at this is something that we did. We started off as a, uh, decentralized organization. Originally, we were focused on a particular business unit. And from there, we kind of grew. Like I said, we had originally four people. Uh, we were trying to support about a $2 billion uh, business at that time. It's grown since then. And the organization has come together. So whereas within Dell Technologies, we had separate 
organizations for data protection, storage, server networking. We brought this all together under one umbrella uh, coming up on three years ago. So we cover everything. There's a lot of cross collaboration going on within the, our organization. So we share information and that's a great thing. So today, if you look at this chart, we are actually a hybrid because we both address uh, uh, strategic needs of the executives, as well as the tactical needs of the sales organization on what they need to do to be successful. This is a, uh, a uh, paper that's uh, provided by the SKIP organization. For those of you who are SKIP members, you can go out there. It's called Selecting the Right Competitive, uh, the Right CI Organizational Model. And there are a variety of different organization models out there. This paper does a really good job of articulating some of those models and how they work. I won't go through them all here because that would take the rest of the time. However, for those of you who are looking to either validate your organizational structure or looking to, you know, are we in the right structure? Can we create a hybrid? Can we combine a couple of different models to fit our business? Certainly, this is a great start. And by the way, joining Skip is not an expensive proposition. Uh, you get to hear from a lot of great speakers. We have great folks on the team like Abner there. So uh, please take advantage of it. From a standpoint, I get a question along this line as well. How are you as Dell organized? And this is how we are done at the uh, high level. And because we're not really uh, disclosing anything highly proprietary or how, it, how it's done, I can uh, I modify the organizational map to give you an idea. Our organization is, is break, broken up into three basic areas. I manage the subject matter experts or SMEs on the left-hand side. Uh, we respond to a lot of inquiries from the field about you know, I'm competing against competitor X. Uh, how can I beat them? Uh, how, what type of things are they going to claim? How do I refute them? How do I set up uh, landmines or claims against them that they're going to have to pursue? And so that's what my part of the organization does. Uh, we deal primarily with product management as well as sales uh, from a tactical standpoint. The strategist organization uh, is run by one of my peers. And that group primarily interfaces into the sales organization at the executive level, meaning our sales leadership, as well as our training organization. And I'll give you an example of how uh, we function in that and provide guidance to sales and our training organization to make ourselves more effective. Last but certainly not least is, is marketing and their primary uh, information is to talk with our uh, product marketing, corporate marketing, messaging, to make sure that we have consistent uh, information going out within our messaging. And the reason this, this functions across all three is because we work as a work group. So subject matter expert team members work with the strategists, work with the marketing folks, and that's a work group. And then we focus you know, by server networking, et cetera. Uh, and that's what you see as the BU in the middle section. So we uh, sometimes call three in a box, sometimes four in a box with our uh, program managers who keep everything together and functioning and moving forward. But that's how we are organized as an organization with 40 people. From a standpoint where CI Lives does make a difference, uh, we happen to live within the marketing organization. Prior to this, my, my organization lived within the uh, product management organization, which was not always uh, good functionally. Um, a lot of time, you know, I don't want to say it's wasted, but a considerable amount of time can be consumed by product management, uh, chasing down things that really uh, are small items like a particular function, when in fact, I, I as a product manager always like to keep my eye on the broader market, what's going on, because from a philosophical standpoint, I've always taken the approach that I'm building products for markets, not for individual companies. But, and that worked for me. Um, yeah, I'll, if, they, if it makes sense there, I'll give you an example. One of the things here is budgetary considerations. So one of the things that, you, that we often get asked is I need this or I need that and I need it now. And you know, even as large of an organization as we are, we have to kind of work on a zero sum game. So if somebody wants something and they want it really bad we will have a discussion with that stakeholder and say, okay, um, for this particular segment of the business, we're covering this for you today. If you really want us to do this, what one of these things do you want us to take off the table? And that's a perfectly legitimate way to, to have a, a productive conversation. And it forces 
the stakeholder to actually place a value on what they're asking for versus what they're getting today. Um, from a budget standpoint, sometimes you just can't do it. And uh, I'll, I'll refer to a, a little bit of a crude uh, phrase if you'll excuse me. You know, sometimes I just can't make roast beef out of horse's ass. It just can't be done. So, or horse's rear end. Although I, I, I imagine there are some places where that's quite tasty. Um, but from a practical standpoint, I can't do it. So sometimes you need to have these hard conversations as, and as long as it's fact-based, most of the time you can come to a very reasonable uh, accommodation with that particular stakeholder. What tools do we use at Dell? It's evolved over time. So what you're gonna see here are some things that we learned early on, and it doesn't take a lot of people to do this. Of course, they were a large organization, but like I said, when I started off with our team, we were four people. So it doesn't necessarily require that. It does require some uh, things. Some of these things don't, don't, re don't require money either, uh, such as if you're doing probability impact, what's that gonna mean? Well, let me give you an example here. We all try and, and want to have the strategic shift. That's always the big golden nugget that every company wants. However, um, to, as an example, there could be a major disruption. So if you look in the upper left corner at the high, is something that could happen that high, has a high impact, but low probability, you know, that would have been, uh, you know, what you might think of as uh, desktop, uh, you know, VDI, virtual desktop, uh, integration or, and what happened last year with the pandemic is that a lot of companies had to jump to the cloud to do work, you know, to do a virtual desktop. So all of a sudden everything moved over to the cloud for virtual, uh, virtual desktop. If you had asked anybody prior to last year, they would said, yeah, that could, you know, there could be an event that creates that major disruption, but the probability of it happening are low. As we saw last year, that wasn't the case. Uh, we are seeing, frankly, a lot of those customers who did make the jump when they start getting the bills in from, you know, their cloud providers, they're like, wow, this is really great, but boy, is it expensive. Hey, Dell, help us figure out how we could take those workloads and move it back on premise at a reasonable cost. And you would be surprised how low the cost that is for us to help customers implement. That's really the only uh, commercial you're going to get from me. You have over here the customer satisfaction. Um, which you can try and identify how do we move customers from one quadrant for another. Of course, we all want them to be evangelists for us or apostles. Um, sometimes the hostages are the best people to go after. For example, I fly United Airlines quite a bit because I'm based out of Denver and I have a whole bunch of miles, but guess what? I can't use them. So therefore I'm being held hostage in my mind. Therefore United would do really good to try and get my mindset on how can we make our programs easier for the cash in those miles, be more flexible in times I can use that uh, to try and get me back into the apostle side. Um, there are, of, of course, war games. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. Here's an interesting one. I was in Beijing, uh, or actually Shanghai, a couple of years ago, and one of the uh, speakers was from Israel. And uh, I was talking with Rand. I said, I bet you're familiar with this, this term, ipramistabra, uh, and he goes, well, sure. And I, so, I, so I asked him to explain what it meant to the audience who is, uh, you know, Chinese nationals. And he goes, basically, you know, what your view is, isn't quite right. You need to reconsider it. It's a little bit of contrarian type of thing. And, and so Rand and I were talking about at lunch. He goes, so I come all the way from Israel to Shanghai to hear some Japanese American guy from the U.S. talk to me about Ipra Mistabara. So we were having a good chuckle over that over lunch. But essentially it's, you know, I try and say, make sure you have somebody on your team who can sit there and be the contrarian because that's gonna be an important thing because otherwise it's too easy to get into group think, especially as your organization grows bigger and you're getting input from more people. You need to have somebody who's really dedicated and good at doing the, uh, the uh, contrarian point of view. Uh, a lot of the, the stuff is, is captured in the book called Red Teaming by Bryce Hoffman. A lot of the lessons in those in that book is learned directly from the uh, Israeli Israeli IDF over the years, and so it's a great read for you know. I know the uh, Israeli folks, <clears throat> folks on the uh, call are, are probably all familiar, familiar with that, but for those who aren't, it's a very good read. Of course, you can have different technology platforms, and this is what I was talking about earlier. If you're not good at Gestalt, there's a company out there called Kedge. They're based in the U.S. out of Florida. And they run seminars, uh, you can see kedgefutures.com. And they really do teach a, 
really do a great job of teaching how you can see around corners, how you can project out and, and see, you know, get a better feel on taking more of the uh, broad industry things that are going on to, uh, to improve your gestalt. So what, you know, the big question that I get asked when, when companies come to me is, what are you trying to show? Are you trying to give your executive a competitive information at a glance? Are you trying to do win-loss product analysis? Is it trending? Is it comparisons over time, point in time, quarter over quarter, year over year? Are you trying to show heat maps? How do we compare to, how does our competition, who are they going out there with to try and compete against us? Are there selling trends? Uh, where's the competition going? Uh, for those of you who are entre entrepreneurs in the audience, one area that we still think is lacking in the industry is social listening. And I'm not talking about social listening as how are we doing as Dell Technologies. I'm talking about social listening as I want to know how competitor X, com uh, their, their um, uh, customers are feeling about their, their products and their services. Are they happy? Are they unhappy? Did, did, did the company put out... Uh, patches are making customers really unhappy because it messed up things worse than it, than it was before. That's the area that is lacking today, and we have not found a solution in uh, the industry there. So the question is, what are you trying to show? Because that will start dictating what type of technology that you are, you're, you're going to want to look into. Uh, the question is, does visualization matter? And the answer, the answer is, it matters hugely. Let me give you an example here. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy, from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000, and $40,000. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over. Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. 
In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace it's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? So with that, um, I think it, you get an idea of the importance of visualization. I would frankly rather watch that video, then look at a, a tabular spreadsheet of 120,000 data, uh, 120, data points. By the way, uh, that was Hans Rosling. That was from the older uh, BBC uh, broadcast. Unfortunately, Hans passed away a few years ago. However, based upon that video, he and a team of, of engineers actually created software uh, called um, uh, Gapminder. And you can go to gapminder.org. It's software, it's free. And you can use this software if you have a lot of tabular data or spreadsheet data to do that same type of visualization. It's free, it's pretty easy to learn. We use it, uh, but certainly you can see how that type of visualization is much more impactful than showing somebody a spreadsheet full of numbers. So what do we use within Dell uh, from a data orchestration and collection standpoint? We use salesforce.com. Uh, we tend to put that into a green plum database or uh, data lake, as you might think of it today. We use a variety of data visualization products, including Tableau, Domo, uh, Microsoft Power BI, and Gapminder. Our competitive platform for disseminating information out to the field is a platform called Clue. Uh, we use a different set of data sources for outside analysis and aggregation. Some of them are free, some of them are fee. And so there's lots of stuff out there. And we're doing data aggregation analytics through a couple of different products. One of them is Quid. We're also looking at, a pro at evaluating a product right, right now called Sharper. Analysis, again, you know, those are kind of the basic things, but we try and analyze on a regular and ongoing basis. What is our competition doing? We try and place ourselves within the four walls of that organization and place ourselves, if we were that company, what would we be doing next? From a visualization standpoint, it's really important, as I said before, for you to understand what it is you're trying to visualize to your stakeholder. Because different stakeholders have different needs. The executives want a short and, and dirty type of thing. So visualization is really good for them. Um, the people who are doing tactical sales or, or um, you know, product management or engineer may not need as much data visualization, but it's still something that you're going to want to ask yourself is, Who's my audience? What do they want to see? And the best way to do that is to ask them because they'll be very uh, straightforward, at least I've found. Uh, they know what they want to see and how they want to see it. This is an example of some of the things that we do from a heat mapping and, and visualization standpoint. Uh, we keep track of our competitors month to month, quarter to quarter. We could do it week to week if we wanted to, but, but that takes a lot of processing. Uh, so on the heat map, it shows where our competitors are, are uh, uh, teaming up or partnering with other uh, competitors. And of course, if you're smart about it, you can sit there and say, how can I disrupt that? 
How can I disrupt that um, relationship? How can I disrupt that go-to-market emotion? And so that's part of what we do. We also do uh, a lot of visualization on what uh, use cases our customers are buying products. So it could be data protection, might be Microsoft uh, applications. It could be remote office back office. So we collected this, a lot of this information in salesforce.com, which we have uh, customized for our own needs. So that's how we collect this information. That's how we can get this. We do have agreement from the sales organization to make sure that the data is accurate. Because of course, if it's not accurate, it's going to be garbage in, garbage out. So there's a motion that goes on within our organization that makes sure that we take everybody, get them on the same page so that we get good data. Uh, this is one I'll just spend a couple of minutes on. This goes back to what I was saying earlier about the training organization. Each quarter we look at um, how our sales people are doing, how they're competing against each competitor. And we, what we have found is over time, we can find the top one or 2% of people who are great at continuously uh, beating a particular competitor. What we then do is we take that information, we feed to our training organization, hey, you need to go talk to these two or three people because they're really great at being the competition. In turn, our training organization interviews those people and says, what is your secret sauce? How is it that you're able to consistently beat the competitor month after month and quarter after quarter? They then turn that into training for the rest of the organization. And guess what? It doesn't cost a lot of uh, processing to do that, but it takes a little bit of time to figure out who are those really great competitors. So. What this comes down to is if we, if we can get um, the turnover or what we call pipeline velocity, the more turnover you can get, the, the better your revenue is gonna turn out to be. And that's one of the things that we've done. Think of it in, a, in the context of Dell. If we're a $94 billion company and we've, if we can move that needle 2%, that's a lot of money. CI platforms, there's a lot of great CI platforms out there. The one that we happen to, look, to uh, have adopted is a product called Clue. Uh, it's a company out of uh, Vancouver, Washington. It's, it was originally designed as a uh, battle card platform. We took it completely in a different direction. So what you'll find is that our implementation of Clue, if you, if you want to ping me uh, offline and, and talk about it, uh, I'm happy to show you what we're doing uh, because how we implemented Clue is different than uh, everybody else in the industry. We use it as a platform. And uh, to give you some idea, we did this in 2016, uh, and 17 time frame. Uh, we started off with about 25 users. That quickly grew to 100, 200. Uh, within four months, we had 1,500 users. So you could tell from the standpoint, if you're trying to figure out how you can scale your organization to meet a large number of stakeholders, this is how we did it. Uh, today, we have over 25. Actually, I take that back. We have over 20, 27,000 users on our platform today. We like measuring ROI. We think it's critical. It helps us justify what we're doing, doing and make sure that we continue to get that investment from our executives. To give you an example here, um, hmm, maybe I have it later on. I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, aggregation and collaboration. This one that we're looking at right now called Sharper. Uh, we like it because it can aggregate a bunch of tools. We're finding that, uh, you know, as we said, we're evaluating the technology. We're doing a proof of concept. Uh, some of the team members, as you can imagine with an organization this large, really like some of it. Some of it uh, is still a little bit immature. And we're working with uh, Chuck Sharp and his team to try and figure out if we can get that uh, maturity coming sooner. But we like it because we can determine as Dell, what are the inputs that we feed into Sharper? And if you're looking for a quick analogy of what this is like, for those of you who are uh, familiar with a, a product called Pinterest, this is kind of like Pinterest for competitive information. You put information into it, it aggregates it, and you can do searches. Uh, we also use another product called Quid. This is a little bit more for our predictive analytics. So we do a lot of predictive analytics on the competition, technology, market trends. And this is what we use. One of the things we really like about it has to do with this mapping function. So it'll sit there and you'll create clusters based upon the information it collects. So you could start seeing right away where the industry is going. And we track that over time. So for those of you who are, oh, those of you who are interested, uh, I think there's a replay from uh, the Skip and Telecom where we did that last fall. Uh, we went into a lot more depth on how we use this for predictive analytics. Um, but it really does work and it can be done today. 
Futurescape just kind of saying where, where are the investments being made? Uh, we do use uh, a product called uh, Global uh, CB Insights. Great product, a little bit expensive, but for those of you uh, who want to keep track of where the money is going, which of course, if you follow the money, you know where the investments are being made. Uh, it's got some great features here like uh, VC linkages, where you can see who's uh, mapping out with who. And this really talks about relationships. So like here at the center of these are, are companies that were invested in like Nasuni, Panzura, and Avir. In the case of Microsoft, they were a partner and eventually acquired Avir Systems out of Pittsburgh. The other ones like Panzer and, and Nasuni, you can see multiple lines from like Northbridge Ventures on the left side. That means that they participated in all five rounds of funding with Nasuni. Uh, the red lines indicate where there are competitors to other companies out there. So some of this mapping can give you a quick visualization, especially if you're talking about where's, where are the investments being made? And we do track that type of thing. Well, if I'm on a budget, there's lots of things you could do from Excel. This is an example of some of the things we did early on to kind of prioritize where, our, where, our, um, where we should be spending our time. These are examples of fee and free. So for example, a lot of these have both free components like Crunchbase and Seeking Alpha and Feedly. And there are other uh, fee-based ones which give you more details, but certainly a lot of these are uh, free type of things. So even if you're a small shop, don't have a lot of money, you can get a lot of the same things that we get today as Dell from these sources. Uh, truth be known, I use Feedly every morning. Um, I use Feedly to go through and I look for information that might help my team. I then forward those articles on email. So a lot of these things can be used today. Sources of information, we tend to think of it in terms of customers, markets, and internal. Uh, customers, of course, are all these type of things, including uh, social media, market intelligence. You know, we look at our competitors. And as a matter of fact, we look at our competitors' competitors to try and see if there are synergies that we might be able to exploit with a competitor's competitor. Uh, there are a lot of uh, industry reports and journals out there, uh, guys like Rand Baldar, and Amir Fleischman are masters at trying to figure out how to get information through social media and these other means. Certainly give them a, a shout. Uh, they're right there in Israel. They're really great, great at this type of stuff. Uh, we use a lot of internal intelligence like product telemetry. We do, keep, we do attend conferences. We keep track of things on news feeds, RSS, slide shares. We attend uh, public companies and their earning calls. So we, we gather a lot of information from these different areas, aggregate it, do analysis on it. And a lot of these aren't expensive. A lot of them are, are uh, free. As a matter of fact, if you go and uh, Google or use, as we said, we like DuckDuckGo as our search engine. A lot of great informa information out there uh, in public. If we're looking at new markets or what, you know, what's going on, we'll look at steep or pestle analysis. And then there's also a, a book out there, which is um, you know, from a guy named Eric Garland. It's slow, again, it's a little bit dated, but you know, there are two versions of it. If you go on Amazon, do not get the big one, get the small one, it's less expensive. And all the salient points you need out of that book are in the small one. Uh, rely upon your ecosystem. So your ecosystem here are your skip members like us, uh, they're peer insights, uh, they're like, uh, the TDWI used to stand for the Teradata Data Warehousing Institute. It's now called the Data Warehousing Institute. Develop your own ecosystem. Add Avner, add myself, add other SKIP members to that. We're always here to help. And the nice thing about uh, the SKIP organization that I have found is that even if you're a competitor at the, at the company level, there's still a lot of great practices and best practices that we share amongst each other that can help you out. So develop your own ecosystem because that's what's gonna make you successful over the long term. Process efficiency, we'll finish up here. And this is what I tell my team all the time. I don't, you know, let's distinguish between activity and productivity. I want you to be productive. That's why I always press upon my team. Find out the important stuff because I don't care how many things you did. If you did a hundred things today and none of it makes a difference, but it's activity, I don't care. I don't want to know about that. You're wasting your time and you're probably going to get me mad over the long term. Uh, you may even, you know, work yourself out of a job, to be honest with you. Um, so I try and press upon my team, focus on being productive. 
because I'm going to ask you, what did you do for sales today? What did you do for the executive? Show me your output. What did you provide? And so we're always measuring those type of things um, uh, as an example, just this week alone, and the, the week is just getting started. We've done over 2000 training sessions about our Apex uh, as a service offering in APJ. So those are the type of things when I said we're fanatical about keeping track of what's going on, that's what I mean. So we often ask ourselves, where, where can we get more efficiencies out of our process? Every year we're doing continuous improvement. Where are we weak versus strong? Can we get more people who help fill in the weak parts or the classes or training that we can take that improve our weak, weak spots? Um, how much can we service today? This kind of comes back to the earlier point I was making. We've, we run a zero sum game. So at some point in time, if somebody wants something, we sit there and we have that hard conversation about. We can do it, but one of these things out here in the list do you not want? And we will use that to help justify incremental headcount for our organization. So when I talk harder, not smarter, let me give you an example. This one I thought I'd put under budget, but I now re realize I put it here. So um, this is an example here. Let's suppose I've got people who are salaried about USD, 175,000 in total burden cost of travel and education, everything else, 200 grand a year. There are 2,080 working hours per year. The reason I know that my wife is in payroll. So she always tells me there are 2,080 working hours a year. That means the cost per hour is $96. Let's suppose you got uh, seven people, that's 673 hours uh, dollars per day uh, per hour or $5,385 uh, $5, per day. If you're working on a project and let's suppose it takes 12 days per quarter, that really means that you're spending about $64,000 per quarter or over half a, or over a quarter of a million dollars per year. Let's suppose I can bring in technology. And this is an example. Again, I'm going to give you these slides. Um, but let's suppose you found a piece of technology, which we did. And these are made up numbers, but it gives you the basic formula on how we did it. Um, we said, OK, using this technology to do visualization and end of quarter reporting, which is what QBR stands for, quarterly business reporting. Let's suppose we found technology that can dramatically improve that here. It, let's, say, let's say it costs $70,000 a year for all seven people. So 10,000 per person. Because we're able to do that, uh, we've had an immediate positive impact of $188,000 that we're not having to spend in people power. And because of the efficiencies, uh, we're now being able to put out those reports in less than 12, you know, with uh, people working 12 days. We can get that done in a single day. That's a 96 percent improvement and we're able to get out the information sooner. That's how we justify things within Dell Technologies to our executives. That's how we're able to justify our expenditures on tools. That's how we're able to show the ROI. So any executive setting going like, wow, if that's the return on investment I'm getting, yeah, this makes perfectly good sense. So this is the type of things that we are fanatical about doing because we try and treat this as if it's our own money. Stakeholder services, we've only got a couple slides left, which is probably good since I only have a minute left. The key here is always, always, always under promise and over deliver. If you do the opposite, you can get yourself in trouble. Uh, the, the, the example the other day about responding to Michael's request, my boss book goes, how quickly can we get this to Michael? I said, uh, three days and we had it done the next day. But the, the key point is I set an expectation and then we over delivered. Last but not, not least, here are some key takeaways. Visualization is possible today. There's a lot of great uh, products out there which are not expensive to do. Uh, modern platforms can help you leverage your position as CI. On any project, start small. Do not boil the ocean because if you try and do a big project, the chances of failure are humongous, they're huge. Uh, we've seen other teams, even within the company today, trying to do these very, very ambitious projects. And it just is so darn hard because while the vision might be good, it might be great. The ability to execute is really difficult. Talked about ROI. Define success. That's a key one. Because if you, you know, if you don't know what success looks like, how can you measure? So follow, you know, look at that. Um, if something works really well, it's a process we call wash, rinse, and repeat. 
And last but not least, uh, celebrate your success. So with that, I will turn this back over to Avner and thank you all for your time and attention today. Hopefully you got something out of it. Oh, Jay, it was really, really <clears throat> exciting, interesting, and thank you so much. I would like to make three points out of what you have said and maybe by this compare where you are and where many of Israeli corporations are regarding CI, okay? Sure. Yep, absolutely. So first of all, you said, um, we will, when we'll get the uh, presentation for you, I think we have to look at it very carefully and really to see what can be uh, implement out of it. Uh, for example, you mentioned, uh, you spoke about visual, visualization, obviously, and you spoke about the use of dedicated platforms. And I can tell you that unfortunately in Israel, CI units are not so sophisticated in this matter. And it's hard to believe because Israel is a very technology-oriented country. Very true. Or state. But when it comes to CI, unfortunately, many of the CI practitioners are still working, uh, using, you know, folders of, uh, of Windows and these kind of things and try to find, you know, uh, yep. uh, softwares which are free because they don't have budget to, 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 to invest in it. So this is one outcome of your excellent presentation. Yep. Secondly, so, and, and you gave just, sorry, sorry to interrupt. We start yeah. off, when, when I came on, um, we start off with Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, and emailing those presentations. So even we started off that way. So it's, I understand exactly where, where the Israeli companies are coming from, because that's where we started. And it works. But, but you gave us vision where we have to go. And yes. that's really important. The second point is you put a lot of emphasis on ROI and measuring. I just spoke about it in the uh, European summit uh, uh, last week. And this is something which I think, not just because I just heard now that Michael Dell is so exciting about it, this is something that has to be, every segment in the corporation has to be measured. And it's true, but when it comes to CI, then you get a lot of uh, excuses for CI practitioners here. And no, it's something that it's very hard to, to, uh, to measure. And it's, um, it's not uh, uh, quality, it's not numbers, figures, it's quality and so on, which I obviously, I don't, I don't uh, agree and don't improve, but to hear it from you, it's again, give us, you know, a, a benchmark when, where we have to go to, because it's not, as I show in the presentation in the skip last week, it's not too difficult to, to implement it. It's a matter of willingness yes. and how much your stakeholders or your senior executives are expecting from you to, to deliver it. And, and that's something that we have to, uh, to uh, do much better than we are doing now. And you, your presentation will give us some good ideas and maybe persuade those who are not so keen about it. And sadly, you spoke about Ibrahim Istabra. That's very nice. <laughs> you know, Ibrahim Istabra, um, it's obviously in here, it's not Hebrew, it's an old Hebrew, which is called Aramite, okay? Yep, exactly. Um, but but the, uh, in English, it's, you, the, 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 it's quite similar to Devis Advocate. And yep. you know, I, I, I wrote a paper for Competitive Intelligence uh, Magazine three years ago about using a Devis Advocate in national intelligence and in business. I just can give you a bottom line, <laughs> okay? When it comes to national intelligence, Devil's Advocate doesn't work very well, in, at least in Israel. And there are many reasons for that, which I don't have the time to, to elaborate now. Um, I'm trying in my consultancy, I'm trying very much to, to uh, persuade CI directors and, and, and executives in cooperation where there are CI units 
to use Ipcha Mistambra as a common tool, okay? And um, it's not a great, at, at this stage, it's not a great success, but, for, but you know, when you spoke about it as one of the tools, I took it very much into my, into my attention in order to see what we can do better about it. And um, just final word, Jay, I appreciate so much all your effort, and it was an excellent a perspective to hear from, from a senior guy in a global leading uh, corporation. I, I think Dell is the one in the Fortune 50, not 550, I think, may, uh, in the list of Fortune 50, or maybe Fortune 100, which we don't have a lot of uh, opportunities, uh, opportunities to hear from. So uh, we highly appreciate all your efforts, and um, I, I'm really looking forward for the next time that we will meet again. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for the invite. And uh, I, I appreciate well, We have that. 200, more than 200 people have, have been attended. So it's a ni very nice number. Okay. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Avner. And thank you to, to the audience for attending. And thank you all. And it was a great, great pleasure. Go to sleep now. Jay. <laughs> oh no, I've got I've got a full day of work now. I know, I know. Okay, cheers. Okay, thank you so much. Bye bye. Um, shalom, shalom. Bye.